We continue this morning from Acts chapter 3 and 4. We're in chapter 4 now. And this is our next to the last message on this. It's been, it'll be about, it's been about nine, it will be about nine Sundays all together. And power, preaching, persecution, and prayer. We're right at the end of this and we're going into prayer. And we're going to end with the prayer next week, which will be so appropriate. The Lord arranged the time because next week is the day of prayer for the persecuted church. And here we see the first church as they were persecuted. When we left Peter and John, they were in the direst or the most dire position, precarious position possible. They were standing in front of the Sanhedrin. They'd been arrested, they have been accused, and now they have replied and we talked about that. And so we look at this morning we continue with what happened to them as they stood in the face of the accusations, the threats from powerful men against two uneducated, rough fishermen who have been called by Jesus Christ to be his disciples and to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, whether they were Jewish or Roman. But they remembered the promise of Jesus and we see in Matthew 10, 19 and 20, these verses you remember in Matthew 10, 19 and 20. In Matthew 10, 19 and 20. There you go. Okay. Don't worry about how to respond or what to say. God will give you the right words at the right time. For it is not you who will be speaking. It will be the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. And you may think, Pastor Jen, you've shown us that verse three Sundays now. I show it to you yet again. Because God keeps every promise He makes. Proverbs 30, verse 5. By the way, we quoted that and we taught that throughout the Philippines as well. That was the theme in Mindanao and the theme in Apari as well. And so we see God keeping every promise that He makes. This is what Jesus told them. And so that's what they did. Peter and John didn't worry how to respond or what to say. God gave them the right words at the right time. And then the second promise of God we see in Acts 4, 8 through 10. Then Peter, what? Filled with the Holy Spirit said to them. And he gives this perfect response. Perfect response under the control of the Holy Spirit. And you say, but this doesn't talk so much about answer, uh, uh, God keeping His promises. Here's the healing. But there's not a lot about God's promises. But all we have to do is look back at other scriptures in the New Testament about what God said He would do, what Jesus said would happen when He, send, when he would send the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit would be their comforter, their advocate, their paraclete, all of these things that you and I must have in a world that is hostile to the Lord Jesus Christ then and now. Jesus says go and when Jesus says go he sends us, he calls us to go to places that don't love him, that don't like him, that are opposed to him. But he says go and he says I'm with you and the Holy Spirit when he, Jesus said I'm with you always that was through the Holy Spirit. He is with us always. We are not alone. And we see the answer to prayer. He says, remember what Jesus said, it will be the words of the Father speaking through you. And here we see it here. The, the Spirit of the Father, filled with the Holy Spirit, He said, this is, and he, gave, he gives the defense. Are we being questioned for this or being questioned for the kindness to this man? And we see the precious and powerful gift of the Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters, understand and listen carefully. We are a spirit-filled church. We are a, in the old sense, a Pentecostal church. But we look at this and we understand. It is not just, oh, I speak in tongues. I speak in this. The Holy Spirit is not a tongue. The Holy Spirit is God. And He has come to do a work. The Holy Spirit is in charge of the church today. Not, I'm not, not this person, not that person. The Holy Spirit, Jesus said, when He comes, He's in charge. He says, it's better for you if I go back to heaven. And the Holy Spirit comes into the church. He comes into our lives to do His work. And we see that here. Again, God keeps every promise He makes. Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes, He will do this, 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 and this. And we see here in a small snapshot in the life of Peter, the Holy Spirit doing His work. Who can change us? Who 
can transform us? Who can take stubborn, selfish, proud, fleshly Jennifer and make her into a woman of God whose life and whose words honor the Lord Jesus Christ? Only the Holy Spirit can do that. I cannot change myself. You cannot change yourself. The Holy Spirit has to do that. And that is one of the missions of the Holy Spirit. He comes to make us holy. He comes to make us like Jesus. And if we are not very much like Jesus, and if we are like our old selves way back when, and there's not an ongoing transformation of, the Holy, of, of, of our lives into the likeness of Jesus, then the Holy Spirit is not being given room to do His work in our lives and in our hearts. Now he will come, and this is a beautiful picture that we see here. He will come and in his empowering and equipping, he prepares us to proclaim the gospel. He does, in power, because brothers and sisters, it's going to take the power of the Holy Spirit to break through the darkness and the lies of the enemy, the lies. When the Rizalistas came to the mountain, there were a whole group, there's a whole group of them they stood before one little woman, Vivian, and they said, this is ours. We be, we, this is ours. We claim this. This is ours. You're not even dressed properly. You're not even dressed in white, so you're dirty. You're not clean. They, these are the claims that they made. And there stood Vivian, little woman, all by herself. Nobody there to back her up and defend her except the Holy Spirit. And she stood and she said, no, this is God's. No, we have built this for God's glory. There's no place for you here. How could she do that? Through the equipping of the Holy Spirit. How could small, weak Vivi Vivian, timid Vivian, laughing Vivian, be transformed into a bold, mighty woman of God who proclaims the gospel with love and with in power and in truth? A change of character, a change the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we see the changing, the equipping for service and the transformation of life. And that's what the Holy Spirit does in us. That's one of the, these are two of the thing, reasons He's come. There are many others as well, but these are two and we see this. And Peter then says, so there's no other hope for the best of us. The best of us, we're going to have to have the power of the Holy Spirit. And then he proclaims what? In the next slide, Acts 4.12, 1 Timothy 2, 5, and 6, there's, no, there's salvation in no other name, no other name under heaven, for there's only one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity, the man, Christ Jesus. He had to be a man. And that's what we remembered this morning, a real body that was broken, real blood that was shed for us. He gave His life to purchase your freedom and my freedom. This is the message that God gave. And Pete, Peter preaches then, and we preach now, I'm sorry, a confrontational message, an exclusive message that the world doesn't love to hear. The claim of God is exclusive. The path to God is exclusive, brothers and sisters. There is no other way, no matter how offensive it may sound, to a world where tolerance is valued. And we talked about this last time. It will take the Holy Spirit Himself giving you wisdom and power and love and grace to live that type of life and to proclaim that type of life in a world that says there are many, many ways to God. I can live this way, I can live that way. You chose this way, I choose that way. I, I choose this way. Uh, another way. And we have to be careful, brothers and sisters, as we look to the Lord, because the things that are not important, don't fight about those things. Don't argue about those things. Don't antagonize people about things that have little to do, little to nothing to do with salvation. What you stand for is what will save people, and that is there is no other name under heaven by which men may be saved. And the Holy Spirit will help us do that. Amen. Amen. And then we go forward. I'm going to, I'm going to skip the next slide. Uh, and then we go forward, and I want to... So he preaches this great message, and then um, I, we talked about this a little bit last time. 
I'm sure his desire was that everybody would be saved. When you share the gospel, don't you want everybody to say, Yay! Praise the Lord! Yes, I accept Jesus! You know, that has happened very seldom to me. Um, it takes, it's a process and it's a time and it's, pro it's probably happened very seldom to you either. It, t it takes time and there are very few times when people will say, yes, this is great news, of course, I leave my old way of life, I want Jesus. Instead, it's often a long path and we'd like to say, what happened next? The Sanhedrin got saved, praise the Lord. But that's not what happened next, is it? Let's see what happened next. We see Acts 4, 13 through 4, 13 and 14, and we see several things here. And I want us to see the three things. In the first service, we touched on these. In the second service, we didn't even get that far. But three amazing things. What did they see? First, they saw the boldness of Peter and John. For they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training. I want to encourage you this morning. You and I, most of us here today, perhaps all of us here today, we are ordinary people, aren't we? We're ordinary people. You may look at yourself and you say, I have no special skill, I have no whatever. Who am I? And what I want you to see here this morning is they saw the boldness of Peter and John and they were amazed because they were ordinary men with no special training. Brothers and sisters, God takes what is ordinary and makes it extraordinary. God takes what is not so special at all and makes it special. The transformation happens in the hands of God. And that is why as you walk with God and you serve Him, give yourself to Him completely. Put yourselves in God's hands and say, God, here I am. If you can use me, I'm yours. And in God's hands, He will make what is ordinary, extraordinary. Extraordinary. That's His job to do. And that's what He did for Peter and John. Number one. Then what do they see next? They recognize them as men who had been with Jesus. Men who had been with Jesus. Now, part of this means that they finally realized, oh yeah, we, re we recognize you now. That's right, we saw you with Jesus. That's one part of this meaning. But brothers and sisters, and that's not the only part of this meaning. The other part of this is that there was an understanding and a recognition. These are men who have been in the presence of Jesus. And when they saw these men, and this is part of what this means, when they saw Peter and John, when they saw their words, when they saw their faith, when they saw their boldness, when they saw their lives, they saw Jesus. The one they had put on the cross and the one they had said, we thought we got rid of him. We thought he's long gone. But no, because he lives, we too shall live. And what Jesus won for us on the cross, that life is yours. That life is mine. So spend time with Jesus when you're on your own. Get in His Word. Let the Holy Spirit fill you. Look on Jesus. Spend time with Him. And as then as you go out in your families, in your work, in your business, in the world, as you live, as you talk, as you work, as you walk, people will look at you and they will say, you have been with Jesus. You have been with Jesus. That's what happens. These missionaries that I just told you about, as they walk through the barren guys, as they walk through the dusty fields, as they go around, you know, what you know what they look like? You know what people see? They see Jesus. They see Jesus. And that is what, that's, what, that's how it's supposed to be for you and for me as well. And then the third amazing thing, so their boldness, They've been with Jesus, and then finally, the healed man standing right there. That's the third amazing thing. And there was no argument about it. He had been crippled more than 40 years before. And what could they say? He was standing there. In the original Greek, do you know what this means right here? The man who had been healed, the, the meaning in the Greek, this, we just read this, oh, he's been healed. In the original, in the Greek, it means completely fully healed, restored. Nothing, no limp, no weakness. Imagine that. Those of you, Jin, uh, Jin Fu is a doctor and others as well. How many of you, when you haven't used, uh, you've been in bed a long time, maybe you've been sick or, or maybe, you've, you've, maybe you broke a bone and you wore a cast. Remember 
how weak that part of your body was when you tried to start walking again. You, can, you were so weak. Look at this. Here's a man who's never walked and he's standing there in front of them. Three amazing things. And brothers and sisters, when God is at work in your life and my life, there should be, there should be the miraculous. There should be the miraculous. I'm not talking about something strange or weird or woo. I don't mean that at all. There should be the miraculous because God is a miraculous God that moves beyond the laws of this world and this universe. There should be the, a miraculous display of power, of God's power in your life and through your life. We see it here and that is what changed the situation. So we see these three things. Now, do they turn to the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, let's see what happens next in the very few minutes that we have left. We see, we're going to skip a, we're going to skip the next slide. We'll keep on going. Um, this was their opportunity to talk about Jesus. What can they do? It's time for a private conference. Let's look at Acts 4, 15 through 17. They get Peter and John out of the council chamber. What are we going to do? We can't deny it, but we don't want, we don't want them to spread, spread their propaganda. So we must warn them, don't speak to anyone in Jesus' name again. And I wanted us to look at this because I talked about this two times ago, I think. How do we know the details of what has gone on in this private meeting that's closed? The Bible does not tell us. We won't know until heaven. But many, 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 uh, the Holy Spirit could have told Luke, say this, this, th write this, 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 and this. And the Holy Spirit did uh, inspire Luke to write. But many, many Bible scholars believe, believe that part of this group, included in this group, was probably that hot-headed young man, an opponent of the gospel of Jesus Christ, Saul, who would later become Paul. And so we look at this, and if that's true, and it's very, very possible that it is, we look at this and we think, nobody accepted Jesus Christ. And we think, failure. But if Saul was part of this, he heard, and there was a beginning there. And then sometime later, who did he see? The boldness of Stephen, the first martyr of the, of the, Christ, of, of the, church, the martyr of the church. And it is very likely that Saul was in that meeting. You don't know who you're speaking to always. You don't know the result that will happen when you are faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ. But when we stand for Jesus, He stands for us. When you don't compromise, God will use you to change the world. To change the world. And I want us to close with this. What's my time? What time is it, somebody? I have one more minute. Mm, 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 mm. I want us to close with this. Uh, and the next Acts 4, 18 through 20, and I want you to see this, and we'll close with this, and I want you to think on this. If you are going to live for the Lord in this world, this is going to happen to you. Look carefully. If you are going to live a so-so life for Jesus in this world, this is not going to happen to you. Okay? If you choose to live uh, an under-the-radar Christian life where you don't, you know, don't say so much, don't do so much, you will probably never face this. But if you are going to really live for God, there will come and there should come in your life those times when people will say to you, do not. And what they told them was, don't speak again in the name of Jesus. The words of man, the command of man, the command of this world that says, do not. Do not. And if you're going to live for Jesus, this is going to happen to you. Peter and John replied, do you think God wants to us to obey you rather than Him? We cannot stop telling. And if you're going to live for Jesus, there will come the command of the world, do it this way. Why are you doing it that way? Everybody does it this way. You don't have to whatever. It may come in all sorts of packages. Your response if you're going to live for the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be this. But you will have to decide. You'll have to decide. Are you going to live the way that the world lives? No problem. You will never face this. 
But if you're going to live for the Lord Jesus Christ, if you have determined in your heart, I am going to obey God rather than man, you will face this. But brothers and sisters, be assured of this. If you stand for God, He stands with you. If you obey Him rather than man, God will honor you and strengthen you, empower you, and equip you. And He calls us, He calls us to this. You will have tribulation in this world. But Jesus said, be of good cheer. I have what? I've overcome. I've overcome the world, and I'm with you always. Let's close in prayer this morning.